BBC News. And there was no need to break the piggy bank. The main news again. A new tax-free savings scheme which can be sold in supermarkets has been unveiled by the government. It's meant to attract low-income savers, but will mean more tax for the better off. The next news is, of course, the 9 o'clock news. From the 6 o'clock team, good evening. Good evening. Good evening to you. Well, it's rather a wintry scene now for the rest of this week for most of us, though the far north may become somewhat milder come Friday afternoon. Now, there is a warning in force for the rest of the night. Certainly where roads are untreated tonight, almost anywhere in Britain, there could be some pretty slippery patches with a fairly widespread frost. And for northern and eastern Scotland and down through eastern counties of England, further sleet and snow showers adding to the misery. Now, we've seen plenty of showers today, especially across the northeast of Britain there. Also, that rain and sleet continuing through east Anglia and southeast England. Quite a substantial snowfall, as we've seen already on the pictures across parts of the southeast, over in Wales too, and down through the southwest of England, we've seen some heavy snowfall during the course of the afternoon. Well, those snow showers, snow showers will continue in the north and the east throughout the night. Further west, though, patches of freezing fog could also develop, and a very, very cold night indeed. Temperatures down to minus three to minus six degrees once again in some areas. Just one or two coasts will see temperatures staying above freezing. More generally, down the eastern side of England, despite that rain and sleet and some snow showers for the Downs and the Moors, you will see temperatures just hovering a degree or so above freezing tonight. But basically for tomorrow, we are under the influence of the low pressure there on the continent and cyclonic northerly winds on its western flank. So again, for eastern Scotland especially, down through these eastern counties of England, always a good deal of cloud and further rain and sleet to come, with some snow especially on the higher ground. Freezing fog patches further away still gradually clear away to give most places a good deal of sunshine. It may well be, as the computer picks out here, that we see those showers pepping up again during the day on the eastern side, drawing in rather more cloud and sleet and rain from the North Sea as time goes by. In more detail then, for northern England on Wednesday morning, plenty of cold weather about, some icy roads to watch out for. Again, those sleet and snow showers over and to the east of the Pennines and gathering during the afternoon, leaving western parts seeing the best of the sunshine. Temperatures typically 5 degrees, and that's the way things are going to be for many western parts of Britain. Just the odd shower on windward coast and temperatures maybe up to 6 or 7 on the west coast of Wales and southwest England. Looking on then, the high pressure begins to build, but I think for a time on Thursday, still some sleet and snow showers for eastern Britain, more particularly in the southeast, with other parts seeing freezing fog and a cold night, followed by plenty of sunshine by day. Most places on Friday could be dry, at least for most of the time. That's it from me. Tonight, a Crime Watch special, unsolved cases from the past. The murder of the Dixons, robbed and shot in the back eight years ago as they walked along a clifftop path on summer holiday. And a series of armed robberies where a sadist shoots people who surrendered. Can Crime Watch viewers on old cases once again find new clues? Crime Watch still unsolved, BBC One, tonight at 10. Take your pick, Sardinia, Barbados, Madrid. They're yours on holiday, BBC One, in half an hour. The day's news in the southeast now on BBC One with Mike Embley and Gwenon Edwards. Tonight, watch out Mr Prescott's about the Deputy Prime Minister's warning to some of London's richest councils. <laughs> Also tonight, peace at last for Annie Linsell, who took her battle for a dignified death to the High Court. And out go pin numbers, in comes ID, withdrawing cash in the blink of an eye. Good evening. And welcome to Newsroom South East. But first tonight, Peter Mandelson today promised the Millennium Exhibition at Greenwich would be on time and within budget. But as the Minister was quizzed by a Commons Committee, it was revealed that London Transport, one of a number of companies wanting to offer combined transport and entry tickets, has demanded to be paid up front. It's again cast doubt on the viability of the whole project. Karen Allen reports. The embarrassment over transport took the sheen off the Minister Without Portfolio's pitch about what the £700 million Millennium Dome will actually house. London Transport's proposal that they be given the cash up front for tickets indicates a lack of faith in the scheme. We should pay them for 12 million tube tickets. Since we know 
while we expect a lot of people to come by tube, a lot of other people will come by different means, that would be an unnecessary expense to the exhibition, which we don't think is appropriate. I don't blame you. I don't blame you either. They no, certainly exactly. didn't spill the beans on that to us last week, <coughs> or they might just have had a little less pleasant time with us. <laughs> Gerald Kaufman, chairing the committee, said he hadn't yet ruled out calling London Transport back in order to explain themselves. London Transport was saying little this afternoon, but they did say they were interested in pursuing the idea of a combined entry ticket to the Millennium Experience. As to the revelations about cash up front, there was no comment. But Peter Mandelson, speechless after a bone-shaking visit to a French theme park, was keen to use today's appearance in front of the select committee to flesh out the detail about what will go on inside the dome. Among the 40 exhibits planned is one which explores the future of work. Our working title for that interactive exhibit is Qualify for 20 Jobs You Never Knew Existed. And there was little more explanation than that, though more was promised in the spring. Revealing, though, was Mr. Madelson's admission that on coming to office, he was uncertain whether to continue the project, though cancellation would have cost up to £100 million. We were concerned about the apparent absence of any idea of what would go in the dome, the contents of it. Confident that they are now back on track, Mr. Mandelson's parting words was that he was now a happier minister than he was six months ago. Whether that happiness can be sustained depends on whether private sponsors are equally certain of success. Karen Allen, News from South East, Westminster. John Prescott said tonight he wants an end to what he calls the war between Whitehall and local government over council spending. The Deputy Prime Minister may well have sown the seeds for a bitter battle with several local authorities in the South East. Westminster and Kingston are among those expected to suffer from the proposed changes in the way the government decides how much they should spend. And Oxfordshire, which warned of savage cuts to services unless it got more money from Whitehall, heard tonight it will get no special treatment. Council print its council tax bills in May. It had thought the Labour government would end capping. It didn't. £6 million it was due to spend over the cap had to be saved. Among the cuts planned, a teaching post at St Barinas School in Didcot. Instead, parents used their council tax rebates to pay the £14,000 to keep the teacher on. It should be supplied. You shouldn't have to sort of pay extra money. But if that's the way you've got to do it, that's the way you've got to do it. Do you think it's right that you should have to do that? I think it's entirely wrong. The government agrees and says it's done its sums and has found extra money for schools. And it warned county councils like Oxfordshire that if they try to make savings by cutting money to education, it'll teach them a sharp lesson. In his statement, John Prescott was dismissive of the county's special pleading. I might say they're no more difficult than they are in other parts of the country and we have to have a fairness in how we deal with it and how we distribute the national resources. Councillors estimated tonight they'll have to save £10 million in the county and they'll be hoping this morning's snowfalls don't spread to Oxfordshire. With only a million pounds in reserves to last the next six months, the snow ploughs and gritters would be an unexpected extra expense. <laughs> but the Deputy Prime Minister was playing Santa Claus this afternoon, reminding MPs of extra money already promised and announcing changes to the way the government decides how much councils can spend. London's boroughs, however, may prefer to see him as Scrooge. It's hard to believe that leafy Kingston-upon-Thames is as needy as beleaguered Barnsley. Yeah. We have ca I'm sure the Liberals totally agree with that as well. This image of leafy boroughs, they may be green and leafy, but there are real pockets of deprivation and genuine issues that need to be tackled. And the problem is there is just not enough resources going into local services at the moment, and this settlement from this government doesn't make a difference. But Labour's real bet noir is Conservative-run Westminster, which for years it's claimed has benefited unfairly and so been able to keep council tax bills artificially low. The amount they're allowed to spend will fall by 8%. The previous government's formula treat people staying in the Ritz in London as if they were deprived as the average local resident. That was unfair and wrong. What it means really is, is plain political vindictiveness. They've always wanted to get at Westminster. Westminster has been to see them to explain the problems that they've got as an inner city borough, but it clearly hasn't been listened to. Whatever the individual impact with ministers sticking for now to Tory spending limits, the capping of spending, regularly attacked by Labour in opposition, looks set to remain. Sean Lay, News from South East Westminster.
So, what does Oxfordshire make of it all? Live now to the Chief Executive of the County Council, John Harwood. Mr Harwood, thank you for joining us. As we came on air this evening, it began to look clear that council tax bills would have to rise. Uh, Kent, for instance, was talking about a possible rise of up to 14%. How bad is it with you? Well, it looks as if we're going to have to increase our... percent. The trouble is that uh, that isn't actually flowing through into our expenditure. It is making up for a reduced government grant. So I think local people are going to be wondering why uh, council tax bills are going up by 10 or 11 percent, but the actual amount that uh, the county council is being allowed to increase its own budget is going up by about the rate of inflation. And right. that is just not enough to take account of the uh, increased numbers of children we have in our schools, the increased numbers of uh, elderly people that we need to care for in one way or another. And that's why uh, when you take that with the increase that the government is asking us to make in schools budgets, which we want to provide, and we, uh, we want to try and restore some of the cuts, the very serious cuts that have been made to schools budgets in the last few years, we're actually looking for very serious cuts in social services, in libraries, in road maintenance and similar services like that. That. This is bad news for uh, social services, I'm afraid, tonight in Oxfordshire. Mr Howard, very briefly though, you said that Oxfordshire County Council has only a million pounds left in its reserves. Surely the district auditor would have something to say about that, wouldn't he? Wouldn't he say you should never have let finances sink that low? You've spent too much in the past. Well, he's quite right. He has said something about it, and that's why next year we're going to have to put some money back into our reserves, a small amount of money back into our reserves. But let's look at the, pr the pressures on social services. For every four elderly people who this month sadly die, another seven people will be joining our books. Now, those are the sorts of pressures. That's why we're currently spending about four or five million pounds more in social services than the government thinks we should be. Now, next year, rather than recognising those very serious pressures, they're actually telling us to cut our social services budget by about £1 million in cash terms. Those are very serious cuts. Uh, many people in Oxfordshire feel that the social services we have are far from extravagant. We are, after all, the lowest spending county council in the country, and we uh, pride ourselves on providing efficient, good quality services at a very low cost. All right, Mr Howard, I'm sure we'll come back to you on that. I'm sorry, for now we have to leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, now we go back to Sean Lay, our reporter, live at Westminster. Sean, let's turn to London for a second. Why exactly are councils like Westminster and Kingston being targeted by Mr Prescott? Well, just a few minor technical problems, I'd uh, say, but uh, so, we'll yes. probably do this straight. The time now is about. Let's get this right. It's almost quarter to seven. Uh, coming up on Newsroom South East. Winter gets a grip at last as the mild weather turns to snow. And be afraid. Be very afraid. A tribute to 40 years of hair-raising hammer horror. <laughs> But first, Annie Linsell, the woman who asked the High Court to allow her GP to give her pain-relieving drugs, even though they could shorten her life, has died. She was 47 and suffering from motor neuron disease. Miss Linsell, who lived in Teddington, dropped her two-year court battle in October when her doctor said he was willing to carry out the treatment. Paul Tomich reports. Annie Linsell's two-year court battle ended in October when her GP finally agreed to administer pain-killing drugs which, although they might have shortened her life, would protect her from what she called the indignity and the living hell of the final stages of motor neurone disease. I would like now to have the peace of mind of knowing that I could ask a doctor to come along and, having discussed all the options fully with me and with my family, would give an injection and end my life in a matter of minutes or hours. Annie's doctor had refused to administer diamorphine until he had clarification that the act would be lawful. He changed his mind when a panel of medical experts approved the planned treatment. By the time she dropped the High Court case two months ago, the former air hostess was wheelchair-bound and unable to care for herself after a six-year battle with the illness. And for those suffering from motor neurone disease, it seems that Annie Linsell's fight has at least clarified the law on this one contentious issue. Paul Tomich, Newsroom South East.
Annie Linsell. The Metropolitan Police has been awarded more money for the coming year than most other forces in the country. Elsewhere, police forces will get an average rise of 3.7%. The Met will get 4.1%, but some chief constables will have less to spend. Funding for City of London Police will drop by 7.3%, while Surrey will lose more than 8% of its budget this year. Artists from all over the country joined forces today in a campaign to keep entry to museums and galleries free of charge. A petition was handed into the Department of Media, Culture and Sport. The campaign, entitled Free for All, was set up after the government announced a review of admission policies, the results of which are expected later this week. Winter arrived with a bang this morning. Snow and a frost saw some of the southeast slip sliding and colliding all the way to work. The first flurries of the season left a trail of road accidents and delays for motorists and rail travellers. The snow meant fun for some, but in Kent, a fire at an electricity substation left hundreds in the cold and the dark. Robin Gibson reports. Many were caught out by snowfall, which came as a sharp shock after the recent mild spell. Motorists like these on the A1 in Hertfordshire found themselves battling their way to work. And in Kent, patchy snow has continued to fall throughout the day. There have been several accidents and delays on major and minor roads. It's turned into sleet. Uh, obviously conditions are wet. Uh, light is poor, we did ask drivers to slow down, anticipate the weather conditions and uh, to use their lights at all times. There were further problems for hundreds of households in the Sittingbourne area of Kent. A fire at an electricity substation left many without power in the cold and dark. But there were some compensations. The snow transformed fields and woods into seasonal landscapes such as here in the countryside near Leatherhead in Surrey and some were able to make the best of the conditions. Real snow was an added bonus at this dry ski slope near Chatham in Kent. Would you like okay. to see it stay? Yeah. How, how long would you like to see it stay? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Until Christmas, at least till Christmas. I don't care what the weatherman said, but the weatherman says it's snowing! The bookies have responded to the sudden cold snap. This morning, William Hill reduced the odds on a white Christmas from 7 to 1 to 6 to 1. Well, judging by the temperature here, that's still a reasonable price. Robin Gibson, Newsroom South East in Chatham. From unexpected winter sports to another kind of sport, the news that Formula One motor racing has lost its permanent exemption from the ban on tobacco advertising will not be welcomed by the newest team to join the sport. Today, British-American Tobacco announced their takeover of the Surrey-based Tyrrell team. The new team, to be based in Brackley on the Oxfordshire border, expects to compete in the 1999 season. Angela Davis reports. The worst kept secret in motorsport was formally announced today as British American Tobacco entered the world of Formula One. A flash presentation represented its sporting association, but this is its first time in motorsport's top league. The announcement also confirmed the involvement of top IndyCar manufacturers Reynard, and the new setup has already brought out the Surrey-based Tyrrell team. The reason we have chosen to sell, however, is primary financial. To compete at the top level in Formula One today in a very high-tech business is very expensive and we have not been able to put the funds together to enable us to compete at the highest level. The new team will be based at Brackley but it's already walked into the controversy over cigarette money in sport and it's not been welcomed by other team owners. We don't have the richness to compete on level terms with the teams that are getting that tobacco money. Than it is the team's managing director will be Jacques Villeneuve's current manager, Craig Pollock, which is already fueling rumours that the world champion will be one of the drivers for the new team. With Michael Schumacher also on the shopping list, other teams have good reason to be worried. Angela Davis, Newsroom South East. Now, it's no secret that football management is a fickle business. One minute, you're everybody's hero. The next, you're out of a job. The former manager of Fulham Football Club, Mickey Adams, knows that better than most. Adams was forced out by the arrival of Kevin Keegan and Ray Wilkins. Tonight, he returns to Craven Cottage as manager of Brentford, who need a win to climb out of the bottom three in Division 2. Simon Fordham reports. <laughs> 
Hold together here, if you would, please. Yeah. When Keegan and Wilkins were bankrolled into Fulham, many felt it was Mickey Adams who was short-changed. He'd taken the club from the bottom of the league to their first promotion in 15 years, only to lose his job. Tonight he's back with his new club, West London rivals Brentford. From a personal point of view, yes, it's a great significance to me. Uh, it's a chance for me to go back and say thank you to the fans, uh, and then we can all get on with our own lives. And those fans at Craven Cottage plan a hero's return for Adams, despite him now being in charge at the Bees. Well, I think it will be unique. Uh, you'll have Fulham fans to a man and a woman. I think they'll be giving him a standing ovation. Clearly the first time that a visiting manager will receive that accolade. And it, it just goes to show what he's done for the club. Adams took over at Brentford a month ago. In that time, he's been able to bring in three new players for a total of £100,000. He's watched as his old side have splashed out, spending unheard of amounts for a second division side, with the current total at almost £5 million. But Brentford's new boss says he isn't jealous of his old club and has put what happened to him at Fulham well behind him. It's no use harping back at it. It's done and dusted. Uh, I felt it was a little bit harsh at the time, but I've, I've, I've got no malice. I've got no gripes to, to bear with anybody at, at Fulham. I wish them all the very the very best and uh, all the luck in the world and uh, I do mean that. But maybe not for tonight. Simon Fordham, Newsroom South East. Oh, when it comes to the future of cash point machines, it seems the eyes have it. At last, technology has found a solution to the frustrations of trying to remember your personal PIN number. It's a scanner which reads your eye. Well, Paul Curran is live in northwest London where new technology allowing, and we're not having much luck tonight, he can give the machinery the once over. Paul. Well, imagine, if you will, that I'm in fact standing in front of the cash point of the future. Now, I've got to look directly ahead of me because the box that's being in front of me is a camera and it's scanning my eye and it's checking it against a record of my eye that was put into the computer a little bit earlier. And assuming that everything works out OK, it'll allow me to get up my cash and also check my balance, etc. Now, the people behind this technology is the company NCR, and the senior consultant with NCR is Ian Buxton. Ian, now, how does it all work? Well, basically what it's doing is taking the 250 elements whose combination is unique to you and then comparing it with that record and saying, yes, that's Paul Curran. Well, what about if my eye changes? Say I've had, you know, a few nights yes. on the beer. <laughs> no, you won't have a problem there because this is looking at the iris and that's not affected like that. The retina might be, but the iris is not. OK, but what about if I was to take a photograph along of somebody else with their card? Could it be corrupted like that? No, again, the iris is moving all the time, readjusting for any light changes. So again, it's going to make sure it's alive and well. OK, well, that's the sort of technology side of it all. But it's how is it going to work for customers? Now, to find out, there's going to be a trial with um, Nationwide Building Society. And with me is Philip Williamson. Philip, how's it going to work for uh, customers? Well, within Nationwide, we're always looking at uh, innovative technologies to improve our customer service. During the pilot, our customers will not need to remember their PIN number. Our disabled customers will find access much easier. And for all of our customers, within a matter of seconds, they'll be able to receive their cash safely and securely. OK, all sounds wonderful. And with that, it's back to you, Mike, in the studio. Thanks, Paul. Well, if all this leading-edge technology is a bit much for you, take heart. Some of our older creations are still thriving. St. Paul's Cathedral, for example, 300 years old today. Sir Christopher Wren's design was on the cutting edge of architecture around the 2nd of December 1697, when it opened, replacing the previous building on the site, which was destroyed in the Great Fire of London. Sarah Lockett reports. <laughs> St Paul's Cathedral still dominates the skyline in the City of London as it has now for 300 years. Sir Christopher Wren's classical Renaissance building has stood the test of time, though it was radical in its day, breaking the Gothic tradition for churches. Inside, the choir arrives for Evensong, surrounded by the splendour of gilt mosaics and decorations added in the Victorian era. The cathedral seats two and a half thousand people for things like concerts, which are now held regularly. So although its role has changed, it's still a vital part of the community. And people use it for worship, or is it more like an exhibition? Oh, no, no. I mean, if we stop worshipping, we simply close. Um, you know, we exist first for worship, full stop. Um, it happens to be, you know, one of the most marvellous buildings in the world, um, and people come to see it. 
After the Great Fire of London in 1666, when the old St Paul's was destroyed, this model, built by Sir Christopher Wren, showed the new building he wanted to construct, but it was rejected as too square, and Charles II demanded a longer nave. The final version was agreed in 1675, and although internal decorations were added much later, the shell was built in just 35 years, thanks to large amounts of public money. There was a single source of money for it, which was very important. Uh, they built this cathedral by putting a tax on coal. And as the coal came up the river, the tax man took his share and gave it to build the cathedral. for the choristers with its Grinling Gibbons wood carvings was the first part to be opened and it was here 300 years ago to the day that the first service was held in the new cathedral. The culmination of the tercentenary celebrations comes tomorrow when the Queen, Prince Philip and Prince Charles join 1,600 other guests at a special commemorative service. Sarah Lockett, News from South East, St Paul's Cathedral in the city. something not quite so calming now. It's 40 years since Hammer Horror made its first blood-curdling film and became one of the most successful independent film companies of all time. It all started in a small studio at Bray in Berkshire. Since then, countless maidens have been lost to the wicked vampires, so many in fact that the Museum of the Moving Image is staging a special exhibition in tribute. Heather Lima reports. As a vampire, of course, Christopher. Beautiful women in low-cut nighties, plenty of gore and plenty of screaming. Hammer Studios made hundreds of films and kept millions on the edge of their seats. Come, let me kiss you. <laughs> For two decades, Hammer was synonymous with Frankenstein, Dracula, werewolves and zombies. Screaming was the best known sound, and this actress was known as the Queen of Horror. What is it like to be an actress in any film? It's fantastic. If you can get a job, it's great, you know. But I think horror films are especially good because you get a part you can put your teeth into. <laughs> In 1957, The Curse of Frankenstein was the first horror in full gory colour and the first to receive an X certificate. In 1968, Hammer Films won the Queen's Award for Industry for their exceptional earnings through exports, and no other film company has ever won that. Wendy, I must ask you, who's that chap behind you? Oh, this is my friend, this is uh, Christopher Lee in The Curse of the Mummy. Oh, the real one. <laughs> no. <laughs> By the 70s, the British film industry was in decline. The studios were lying idle. Interest in horror subsided. The audiences fell away. Even full frontal nudity failed to draw people. Hammer made its last film in 1984. <laughs> Yeah, what was that mummy doing? <laughs> Don't ask. All right, I won't ask. Okay. Uh, what about the weather? Uh, any more snow, Mr. Kettley, or what? <laughs> well, Mike, I think there will be, yes. And I must say, the past 24 hours have shown how difficult this job can be on occasions. I did unpull the snow last night, and before I start looking for another job, I'll just show exactly what's happened during the day. There's been plenty of rain, sleet, and snow around, particularly at Biggin Hill, I've noticed. About uh, six inches, well over 10 centimetres of snow over there during the day. And it's still snowing, I should think, up on the downs over the walls too. And a little bit more to come through tonight as well. You can see all the time it's advancing further southwards. There is somewhat clearer weather moving in from the north, drier in a sense, but still further sleet and snow showers to feed in from the North Sea through tonight and indeed through tomorrow as well. So hanging on to a good deal of cloud. The further west you go in the region, the more likely to have some icy roads tonight. Temperatures below freezing here, certainly minus two degrees and could even stay dry. But across much of the region, there will be some further rain sleet with some snow over the higher ground. And similar conditions during Wednesday as well. Oh yes, there'll be some drier and brighter slots in between, but always a good deal of cloud and again some sleet and snow showers to come. Again, giving the odd centimetre or two up over the higher ground. Top temperature are pretty cold and raw, 4 degrees at best for most parts of the southeast.
Looking on then, well, there's the low pressure now scooting away as we go through the week. We're going to see the influence of the high pressure as time goes by, so that eventually we'll see a good deal of brighter weather coming back from the west. But I think on Thursday we'll still see some sleet and snow showers across our patch. Still pretty cold and raw, but hopefully by Friday it'll be sunny again and dry, but still chilly. That's it from me. All right. <laughs> you first. Thanks, John. It may be a chilly <laughs> night, but I hope it's a good one for you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Hetty's wits are tested this week by a family secret. She's a beautiful looking girl. A bit toffy nosed, I suppose. She's being stalked. And the demands of a fake identity. It's to urge the government to decide on its future. Good afternoon. Some cuts of beef are likely to be banned from the shops following new worries over BSE. The government's expected to confirm later today that beef on the bone will be affected. The Ministry of Agriculture says it's a precautionary measure. Well, I'm joined now by our environment correspondent, Margaret Gilmore. Margaret, what sort of meat is going to be banned? Uh, we're talking about things like T-bone steak, ribs of beef, any beef which uh, comes onto the plate on the bone. What they're worried about is um, that although the spinal cord is removed, the clump of nerves joining the nervous system to the spinal cord can sometimes end up on the plate. The risk is absolutely minimal, but they don't want there to be any risk at all. But it does suggest there's deeper concern about the way CJD is transmitted. Well, this is advice coming from the scientists who've been investigating it for the last 10 years, and I've just spoken to one of those scientists who's, who's given us this information. What he says, he's absolutely adamant the risk is, is minimal. Um, it's, in fact, theoretical. But um, they are still investigating how uh, the BSE is transmitted in its human form, and as I say, they are slightly worried that it's possible that um, it's coming down through, from the spinal cord, through the nerves, into this clump of nerves, uh, which sits um, on the bone, and when you cut the bone, that could be exposed. But very, very minimal risk. Theoretical is what they're saying. Briefly, Margaret, when will we know more? Uh, we're expecting a statement from probably the um, Agriculture Minister that sometime this afternoon, the Ministry of Agriculture have confirmed that's happening. They've also confirmed that they are expected um, to um, say that the meat, uh, beef on the bone is to be withdrawn from the market. While scientific experiments continue, that this is because they're putting public safety at first, that the risk is minimal. Margaret Gilmore, thank you very much. Miners from all over the country are converging on London to lobby Parliament as MPs discuss pit closures. The Commons Trade and Industry Committee is meeting amid fears that five pits may be closed with the loss of 5,000 jobs. Leading members of the coal industry are being quizzed by the Trade and Industry Select Committee, while first thing this morning, miners set off for London to lobby Parliament for help. The once massive coal industry now employs just 13,000 miners in 23 pits, but a fall in orders for coal used to produce electricity means that more savage cuts could be on the way. How would you feel if your job were going to go before Christmas? I hope the Labour Party listened to that message. People have got jobs, they want to retain jobs, the only pe people that can help the industry are the Labour Party. They want to get off their backsides and do it. Miners and pit owners such as RJB claim the energy market is weighted against coal, but any reforms the government might introduce are likely to take a long time to influence the demand for coal, while sympathy for RJB mining may be limited by the fact that it is a profitable company. That's all for now. More on the one o'clock news. <laughs> And now look at the South East headlines. Detectives say they fear that three men who abducted two teenagers in East London may strike again. One of the girls was repeatedly sexually assaulted during their two-day ordeal. The girls aged 14 and 15 were snatched in broad daylight in Walthamstow last Friday. They were then kept in a house at an unloaned location before being dumped on East Ham on Sunday. An investigation's underway after a huge fire destroyed a department store at Ashford in Kent. At its height, 70 firefighters were needed to tackle the blaze at the three-storey shop in the town centre. The building was so badly damaged that firefighters had to stop work inside because of fears it would collapse. Government plans to improve job and economic prospects in the region will be announced today. It's creating three new regional development agencies. Their aim is to bring prosperity to inner city areas like Hackney, which remains the most deprived borough in Britain. 
Children from a Muslim-run school in Brent are urging the government to act quickly to decide its future. Last year, the Islamia school applied to become the first Muslim establishment to achieve grant-maintained status. They say the long wait is causing financial problems. That's it. Now the weather with Michael Fish. Hello there, welcome to our daily look at the European scene. It's a pretty windy one over most parts of Europe. Much of that cloud there is giving some snow and there's some thicker cloud in the eastern Mediterranean. That's some uh, real old thunderstorms. They've been cracking away across Italy, Albania, Greece and are now heading towards the eastern basin of the Mediterranean. That's because of that area of low pressure. In fact, we're going to have low pressure swirling around across most parts of Europe during the course of the next few days. The important thing is that as the lows move in across the British Isles, so we'll see the wind direction changing and we will be turning milder, but not so for Scandinavia, Russia or that central swathe of Europe where temperatures will remain at or below freezing for the foreseeable future. So it's a wintry scene for central and northern Europe, still some snow scattered around in many places during the course of the next two or three days. The Mediterranean, especially the central and eastern parts, also unsettled with showers and some showers also beginning to crop up later in the week in the more western parts of the Mediterranean as well. And on the theme of showers, we're going to continue to have wintry showers in the north of Scotland, right the way down these eastern parts of both Scotland and England, one or two feeding across the southeastern corner as well. For central and western areas, it should be a fine and dry afternoon with broken cloud, but everywhere it's going to be pretty chilly. Highest temperature about four or five degrees, and feeling colder than that along the North Sea coast there with that uh, stiff old breeze. Still some showers tonight, especially near the coast and across the southeastern corner of the country. Fog patches in other areas and temperatures dropping to around or below freezing. So a widespread frost, and that means to say watch out again for icy roads. This week in 999 Lifesavers, a prized possession becomes a floating inferno. Hello and welcome to London Today. Our top story this lunchtime, shocking allegations over animal cruelty by police. It's claimed that this Essex police dog was kicked to death by its handler as part of its training. As an inquiry into the case continues, the